to words that people might choose to use to describe the church today in our times would be forsaken and desolate. And so this first reading comes as a word of hope because this word, Jesus, God, is speaking to Zion, to Jerusalem, but it's also a word for the church. The church is the new Jerusalem, is the new Zion. And God is assuring us that he hasn't abandoned the church. He's saying, for Zion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her vindication shines forth like the dawn and her victory like a burning torch. And so God is saying, I will continue to act. I haven't abandoned the church. Nations shall behold your vindication and kings your glory. No more shall people call you forsaken or your land desolate. But you shall be called my delight, and your, la- and your land espoused. God is faithful, even if we're not faithful. And Jesus has promised to be with his church till the end of time. And then the first reading says something astounding. It says, as a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. The Lord t- delights in you and makes your land his spouse. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride... So shall God rejoice in you. Your builder shall marry you. Everything that we've celebrated in the Christmas season is exactly this. God has become one of us. God has revealed himself to us so that we can have this spousal relationship with God. This is God's intention. This has always been his design. To have this spousal relationship, the creator with the creation. And so this is God's desire. This is God's heart for each one of us to have this spousal relationship with us. The reason he came to us, the reason he manifested himself, the the reason he showed himself to us was so that we could enter into this relationship. And so in many ways, we are like this wedding feast that this is the first of Jesus' miracles. Jesus was there as Jesus is here. But even though they were in the banquet, they were lacking wine. And so in many ways, this is where we find ourselves. Jesus is with us, but somehow we're lacking the wine. We're lacking the joy. We're not entering into the banquet. And so Mary is the one who intercedes. Mary's the one who notices that we're without joy, that we're lacking wine. And so Mary intercedes for us. And this is the role of Mary always. And we can be confident that also now, today, Mary is interceding for us. Mary sees our situation better than us and is interceding with her son. And Mary said to the servers, do whatever he tells you. This is also what Mary is telling us tonight. Mary is inviting us to enter into this spousal relationship, to do whatever he tells you, to be so close, to be so intimate, to to have this communion with God that we do what he, he tells us. But in order to enter into this relationship, everything that we've been celebrating the Christmas season is to believe that it's true. Jesus Christ has come to us to reveal to us who the Father is. And what he has revealed is that the Father is love, that the Father is close, that the Father loves you, that the Father desires your happiness, that the Father is concerned for you, that the Father desires the best for you. Because when we know that this is who he is, when we trust this word, when we believe what he's revealing, that he is love, that he is close, that he's gentle, that he's compassion, this is what enables us to do whatever he tells us. Because we know who he is. We know that he has a good intention. We know that he wants our happiness. We know that he wants what's best for us. And simply he knows things that we don't know. So we can trust him. We can listen to him. We can do whatever he tells us. 
And this is to enter into this spousal, intimate, close relationship that God desires for each one of us. And Jesus tells them, fill the jars with water. Something very simple. Something very possible. Jesus isn't asking them to do extraordinary, incredible things. Fill the jars with water. Something they can do. And Jesus is also asking each one of us to do something very simple. He's not asking us to do crazy things, extraordinary things. It's simply to listen to him and enter into his will. In simple things. Loving your children. Loving your spouse. Things that are possible. Things that are ordinary. Even if we don't understand. He also tells them to draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. Did they understand what he was doing? Did they understand he was thinking, planning, knowing to change water into wine? Probably not. Probably not. Does God know? Do we know exactly what God's planning to do with our family? Does God, do we know exactly what God's planning to do with our community? Does God know, do we know exactly what God's planning to do with each one of us? Probably not. And that's okay. He's not asking us to know the big picture. He's not asking us to know his plan. But simply to listen to him. To follow where he's leading us. To enter into his will. And they discovered that the water was changed into wine. And we'll discover miracles. We'll discover that God's acting in ways that we didn't even think of, we didn't even imagine. That divinity has entered into humanity. And the head waiter says, everyone serves good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. And so that's also true for each one of us. God has things that we haven't even planned, we haven't imagined. That the good wine, we haven't seen yet. But it's for us to listen to Mary. They probably trusted Mary. And that's why they listened to her. Let us trust Mary. Let's listen to her. Ask and do what he's asking us. And so this, is, this revealed his glory. And disciples began to believe in him. And so also... Seeing the miracle, seeing the glory, seeing God act in our lives, also people will believe that God is among us. That this spousal relationship is not a theory, it's not an idea, it's something real, something true. It's something that can be experienced, something that can be seen. And it's what St. Paul is talking about in the second reading. It says there's spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. What does it look like? When humanity and divinity work together. Just as a husband and a wife, they create life. And so God also desires that we give fruit, give fruits that are human and divine. That are cooperation of God and man. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're something that are uniquely ours and something divine. There are different forms of service, but the same Lord. There are different workings, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. And so God loves each of us in a unique way. God loves you in a way that he doesn't love anyone else. And so the gifts that he desires to give you are unique, are different than the gifts he's giving to someone else. But each one of us are called to cooperate with the same spirit. It's the same God. It's the same God who's loving us. It's the same God that's coming to us. It's the same God that we're inviting. But then it bears different fruits in each one of us. To one is given through the Spirit the expression of wisdom. And so someone has a wisdom that's human and divine. The wisdom that comes from God. To another, the expression of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith. By the same Spirit. And so, when the Spirit comes into one person, it produces a divine wisdom. To someone else, a faith. Faith is a supernatural gift. It's a gift that comes from God. It's a gift that comes from heaven. 
to have faith. That's not strictly human. To another, gifts of healing by the, by the one spirit. To another, mighty deeds. Mighty deeds. This is what we see in the lives of the saints. Because they entered into the spousal relationship, because they were following God, they were able to do mighty deeds that were clearly not just human. Something human and divine. To another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits. And so this wedding feast is a word of hope for us. That God continues to act. God has revealed himself. God has manifested himself. And he's inviting us into this relationship. But it's on each one of us to trust in his love. To trust in his goodness. To trust in his tenderness. So that we allow him into our lives. So we allow him to have this relationship with us. And this will bear fruit. In our lives, in our families, in our community, in our church, and in the world. And so, as we enter into this Eucharist, let us ask God to give us the grace to believe in who he is and to allow him to come to us. And so, it's in the Eucharist that he's giving himself to us. It really is as a spouse to his beloved, giving himself to us. Saying, I love you, I desire to be with you, I want to share your life. And then, he's waiting for our response. And so, let us welcome him, let us receive him, let us enter into this relationship that he desires for us, so that our lives may be full of fruit that come from God. Oh.